Hello everybody, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Sarah Lindop. I'm a senior lecturer in finance in Aberystwyth Business School. Um, my contact details are, um, are there if anybody would like to email me um, to have a chat or, or to discuss the um, presentation today. Um, and today the presentation that we're going to be looking at is um, the weird and bizarre laws of VAT, so value added tax. Um, just to set the context here, um, VAT is one of the taxes um, that we look at um, in the module taxation um, that we offer um, as a business school module um, to our accounting and finance and business finance students. Um, we also look at income tax, corporation tax, capital gains tax, but I've picked VAT today um, to have a look at because there are some weird and wonderful um, strange um, kind of laws of VAT that affect different products. Um, so I'd like to um, obviously introduce you to, to those in today's presentation. So um, what we're going to be looking at in the next few slides is um, how VAT works. So what is VAT and how it's collected? Um, the difference between what we call input VAT and output VAT the different rates of VAT and the different items that then fall under the different rates and then we move on to um, finish off by looking at the weird and the bizarre and we look at Jaffa cakes, Pringles, gingerbread men, chocolate tea cakes, um, sanitary products um, and we finish off um, the recording today um, with some kind of quick um, quiz questions for you to have a look at um, to see how much you've picked up from the um, from the presentation today. So how does it work? How does VAT work? How is it collected? Um, VAT was introduced in 1973 in the UK by the then Chancellor Lord Barber. Um, it has been adopted or adapted now by over 130 countries and brings over £70 billion annually into the UK economy. It is one of the big earners um, for the government um, from tax revenue. So it's a system of legislation whereby a business is taxed on components that are used to make a product, um, and then this is recouped when the consumer makes a purchase. Um, so it operates by registered traders, collecting VAT from customers they sell to on behalf of the government but these traders can then reclaim any VAT that they've paid or that they've suffered on their purchases and this is where we get the different terminology the input um, VAT or the input tax and the output VAT or the output tax so we have a company um, who obviously charges um, VAT on top of their price of their goods and services. So when they sell products or services, then they they um, they receive the VAT on top of the price. But when they're obviously purchasing their products or their raw materials to make their products, that company would have to pay VAT on their purchases. So we look at the difference between the input and the output VAT um, to work out um, how much VAT then um, gets collected by HMLU and Customs. So input um, VAT or input tax is the VAT that a taxable person or company has to pay on supply to him, her on any goods and services. So this is obviously when you um, purchase goods or purchase raw materials to make to make your goods and services and then output VAT or output tax is VAT that they charge or that you charge or the companies charge on supplies so on the goods and services that they um, they make and sell so the difference between these two amounts is then the amount that's paid to HM revenue and customs so I've just got a quick example here so um, remember that um, VAT, value added tax, is a tax on all goods and services at each stage where value is added, hence the name, the terminology value added tax. So if a retailer had sales of £100 and purchases of £80, both of which are taxed at 20% VAT, um, how much tax will be payable to HMN and Customs? So we have our sales of 100 we have our purchases of 80 If we tax both of those amounts to 20%, we have a tax of 20 for our sales and a tax of um, 16 for our purchases here. 
The profit is 20, the difference between the sales and the purchases, and the payment to H&M New and Customs is 4, which is obviously the difference between the input and the output VAT. So if we're looking at value added here, we're obviously looking at a tax on the profit. The profit was 20. There's a 20% tax on that, which gives us our value added tax of 4. So the difference between the output tax charged and the input tax paid must be paid to h and New and Customs. If there's an excess of input tax over output tax, so you've paid more VAT than you've collected, then this can be reclaimed from h and New and Customs. And most businesses who collect VAT from customers and then can reclaim any VAT that they've paid for any purchases or suppliers that they've made, um, so they can claim this VAT back, are not affected by what we call the direct cost of VAT because as so you're paying VAT on anything that you've purchased but you're obviously collecting that back when you go on to sell the product or the good. However, we do need to consider that obviously there is a, um, a different timing of these payments. So you're paying the VAT on your um, purchases, on your supplies of goods and materials at an earlier point. And then you've obviously got to wait to sell the product, the goods or the product or the service before you get the VAT back from your customers or your consumers. So we could end up with um, cash flow problems because of this timing differences. And of course, um, the, the big thing that we've got to consider is um, obviously VAT means that um, this is a tax on top of the price of a good or service. So if we've got VAT on top of the price, then the price is going to go up. And as we know, with the laws of supply and demand, if price goes up, um, then we have reduced demand. Um, and this is obviously um, a big thing for companies to consider, um, which we're going to look, look at um, as we look at some examples in a second. Um, but this is why McVitie's and um, um, Pringles manufacturer Procter & Gamble um, actually were trying to argue um, that um, their products shouldn't have VAT on top of the price because of course if price goes up um, demand falls. So um, if I asked you the question before the presentation today um, how many rates of VAT are there probably you would say one because we know we all know the standard rate of VAT which at the minute is 20% over the last few years it has changed it's been um 15% it's been 17 and a half percent um but at the minute it is um 20% so that's our standard rate of VAT we then have a lower rate of VAT um that's set at 5% we have a zero rate at 0% and then we have exempt items that are exempt from VAT so there's no rate now you may be sat there thinking well what's the difference between exempt and zero and what's the difference between lower um, and zero um, we will come on to that as we go through the next few slides but there are actually four different rates of VAT so we have the 20% standard rate the 5% lower rate the 0% zero rate and then the exempt rate so unless um, goods or services or supplies are specifically exempt or zero rated then they are always taxable at the standard rate um, with a few examples that are taxed at the lower rate. So the next few sides are just looking at um, different items, different goods um, that are um, taxed under these different, different rates. So we have the lower rated supplies, which is the 5% um, VAT. Um, and these are things like um, contraceptives, um, sanitary products, children's car seats, um, nicotine patches or gum, and um, energy saving materials. So um, things like loft installation. These are examples of lower rated um, supplies. So these are not exempt or zero rated, but they're not standard they're not standard rated standard rated we normally say that things that fall under the standard rate are classed as um luxury items so these are obviously not classed as luxury and um, luxury items but equally they're not classed as necessities under the vat rules because if they're classed as necessities then it's either exempt or zero rate 
So this is the zero rate um, list. So we've got food, which is for obviously human consumption or animal food, although pet food is not included because it's classed as a luxury for having a pet. Um, we've also got exceptions. Um, so food that is used in catering, ice cream, sweets, so confectionery sweets and chocolate biscuits spirits and beer and wine are not classed as zero rated now obviously i want to highlight the chocolate biscuits there because that comes back into play in the next few slides and we start to look at jaffa cakes so chocolate biscuits sweets ice cream alcohol pet food are not classed as um, necessities so they're not zero rated we've got sewerage services we've got books newspapers drugs, medicines, tax-free shops, and protective clothing, crash helmets, bike helmets. These, so these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just an indication of, of some of the things that um, fall under these different rated categories. And then we have the exempt. So with the exempt supplies, um, we've got land, insurance, betting, financial services, education, health and welfare, burial and cremation, entry fees to sports competitions, entrances to museums, so cultural, vision of cultural services, and the postal service there. So these are all exempts. So this is now where it starts to get interesting. If we start to compare what's what's included in these lists of the different um, the different rated items. Um, so just a couple of things before we start to look at um, Jaffa cakes and Pringles and gingerbread men, etc. If a business makes or supplies any exempt goods and services, then VAT cannot be charged on the supply of these to the customer. If a business only supplies exempt um, goods and services, then that means that they cannot register for VAT, which means that they cannot claim back any input tax that they would have paid on their um, purchases. Um, so businesses would actually prefer to be zero rated as opposed to exempt because if you're classed as zero rated then you're still obviously be, you're still able to register for VAT even though VAT is at zero percent but you can still register and you can still reclaim back any input VAT that you would have paid when you obviously purchased any of your products or any of your materials to make your products. So businesses will prefer to be zero rated and not exempt because if you're exempt, you cannot register for VAT. OK, so now we start looking at the um, kind of the the conundrums as, as to what's included under what rates. So the first one that you probably have heard of is Jaffa cakes. So the question is, is Jaffa cakes a biscuit or a cake? Because if we go back if it's classed as a biscuit, you can see here that um, it says in the brackets there, exceptions um, to the zero rate include chocolate biscuits. But there's nothing there about cakes being an exception. So according to the rules, cakes are actually zero rated and chocolate biscuits aren't. OK, so the question was, is Jaffa cakes a biscuit or a cake? So in 1991, H&M Young Customs um, actually challenged the Jaffa Cake manufacturer McVitie's on the um, the Jaffa Cake and um, they believed that they were biscuits and not cakes and um, McVitie's actually um, obviously fought back against this claim and the case went to tribunal. McVitie's actually baked a 12 inch Jaffa Cake to show um, the um, obviously participants in the tribunal and to draw their attention to the cake like base of the Jaffa cake and obviously they were trying to prove that they were actually a cake and not a biscuit now why does it matter remember if they're a cake then VAT doesn't have to be charged on top of the price of the good if they're a chocolate biscuit, then VAT has to be added to the price. So it would mean that the price would obviously increase. Um, in fact, um, H&M Young Customs did rule in McVitie's favour. So the cake um, would then not have to be subject to a, well, VAT at the time was 17.5%. So it meant that the uh, McVitie's didn't have to hike the price of the Jaffa cake up by 17.5%. 
Um, so Jaffa Cakes, um, um, McVitie's was a, a, a successful um, example. Now, as a result of um, the McVitie's hearing um, and also kind of uncertainty as to as to the rules as to what constitutes a biscuit and what constitutes a cake, h and Customs actually published um, a document that showed um, what biscuits came under zero rated and what biscuits came under standard rated. So biscuits covered or partly covered in chocolate or some other product similar in taste and appearance to chocolate are standard rates. In summary, we've got chocolate chip biscuits um, where the chips are included in the dough, they're zero rated. Bourbon and other biscuits where the chocolate or similar product forms a sandwich layer between the two biscuits hot two biscuit halves and is not continued onto the outer surface are zero rated and Jaffa cakes there are zero rated and then standard rated we have wholly or partly coated biscuits um, and, and biscuits decorated in a pattern with chocolate we've got chocolate shortbread and we've got gingerbread men decorated with chocolate unless this amounts to no more than a couple of dots for eyes now this gingerbread one leads me on to kind of my next question um, or my next kind of bizarre scenario is that um, we've obviously got clothed gingerbread men versus naked gingerbread men so what we're saying from the H&M New Customs guidance is that we've, if we've got a naked gingerbread man then they're zero rated if we've got a clothed gingerbread man with chocolate co co um, covering or icing covering then they're classed as um, standard rate and obviously then would have VAT on top of the price. Um, Procter & Gamble, who are the um, um, producers or the manufacturers of Pringles, they actually thought that they would try their luck um, with h Union Customs and argued that their um, product, their Pringles product, was a um, maize based product rather than a kind of a potato um, a potato based product sadly they lost their appeal um, to become zero rated um, for VAT purposes um, because they were identified as um, at least 50% potato so Pringles um, we still have to pay VAT on top of the price of our um, Pringles Marks and Spencer also um, argued they took a case against Hedge Avenue Customs um, regarding their um, their tea cakes. Um, so they actually were successful. They had a 13-year battle with Hedge Avenue Customs, um, and basically um, the tax it, this basically meant that they had a um, reimbursement of over 3.5 million pounds because h and Union Customs had wrongly declared tea cakes as a biscuit instead of a cake for quite a few years. So they ended up having a tax rebate on their chocolate tea cakes. Um, I don't know if any of you remember what we called the pasty tax. Um, so um, in recent years, we've also had a discussion about whether warm sausages, sorry, warm sausages, warm sausage rolls, um, I've put versus hot there, warm sausage rolls versus cold sausage rolls, it should say, um, and warm pasties versus cold pasties. So there, um, if you um, go to a, um, a um, cafe like Greg's, for example, and you um, walk out with hot sausage rolls, um, then you have to pay VAT on top. Um, if they're cold sausage rolls, you don't have to pay VAT um, on top. Um, and the the final one that I've included there, and as I say, these are just are just a small um, few examples of this kind of bizarre, the bizarre rules, um, because of these different rates of of VAT and what falls under these different rates of VAT, is um, what was called the tampon tax. Um, in my list of um, of what falls under what rates, you see that um, sanitary products now fall under the five percent, so the lower rate. Um, but back in um, 2000, um, sanitary products were actually taxed at the full rate, which at the time was 17.5%. Um, but they're now classed as um, kind of non-essential um, items, but, but, they're, um, but they're still um, obviously taxed to a lower rate um, because they're not luxury, um, not luxury items. 
In October 2015, um, this went back um, to the House of Commons to, to, to argue whether um, we sh sanitary products should actually be exempt or zero rated. Um, but unfortunately, again, um, despite a huge campaign to try to, um, to change the rates of VAT on sanitary products, um, the rate still remains unchanged. So it's still 5%, but at least that is better than the, um, obviously, the 17.5% the um, in, in 2000 or 20% if it was standard rate today. So um, the presentation today is just to give you an idea of some of the strange rules. Um, so because of the different rates of VAT and, and obviously the definitions of what falls under those rates, it leads to these kind of weird and bizarre situations um, and where companies have obviously tried to argue against h and and Customs as to whether their products are um, zero rated or standard rated. Um, VAT is going to be around for many years um, and as I say, with all of its intricacies and weirdness, it is actually the third highest um, tax revenue um, pr provider. It brings in the third highest tax revenue in the UK um, and it does look to be a money spinner that is here, is here to stay. Now, um, just to finish off, I have um, 10 questions. Um, to just obviously highlight what we've looked at in the um, in the presentation today. So just a quick quiz here. What are the rates of VAT? What's the difference between input VAT and output VAT? Why would businesses prefer to be zero rated rather than exempt? List two exempt items. List two lower rated items. List two zero rated items. If you buy Jaffa cakes in the supermarket, do you pay standard rate VAT on top of the price? If you buy Pringles in the supermarket, do you pay standard rate VAT on top of the price? What rate of VAT are sanitary products subject to? And why do companies like McVitie's, Procter & Gamble and Marks & Spencer's fight or campaign h and and Customs on this issue of obviously which rate their products and services actually fall under. Okay, thank you for your time today. I hope you enjoyed that.